Bible verse. Greetings, I'm Shad, and it's high time that we talked about the Gladius because there are a couple of things that are misunderstood about it and are almost underappreciated because one of the things that people might um, uh, misunderstand about the Gladius because this is uh, more stereotypically associated with the Romans but what should be kind of understood just in terms of the um, uh, where it comes from, uh, more tied to time period and region, not necessarily just the Romans. People that fought with the Romans end up picking up Gladius and using them because they were generally, not always, but generally better made than um, the types of people that they were often fighting, especially if you look in you know, Central Europe and when they were fighting different Celtic tribes and other things like that. And when they went to fight in the Germanic regions and even the British Isles, the quality varied, but the Gladius is a very broad broad-reaching sword that uh, other people also copied and started making as well. So uh, that's one of the things uh, to address. But the other thing that I was leading into is to assume that because it's a sword of, uh, you know, the Roman period and things like that, that uh, it's an inferior sword to swords that were developed later on when swords of this kind, the blade shape and design, still were around in the later period. So those are th some things that I want to address. Uh, another thing as well, uh, in terms of the terminology, gladius is a Latin word for sword. Literally translates to sword and could be referred to any sword type. But interesting thing what we do in the modern day is often um, call different types of swords what they were called in the language that they came from. Which is why I actually think an appropriate name for the Viking kind of period sword is actually sverd or sverd um, because that's the Norse word for sword and it helps uh, <laughs> avoid any misunderstanding to think that only the Vikings use that style of sword because they didn't. It was a sword of the culture and period that many people used just like the gladius interestingly enough we're also going to be comparing it to some other sorts to get a good baseline and understanding of uh, just how effective the gladius was stereotypically like because there, there are multiple types as well which we'll go into and so that'll be a bit of fun but before we dive into that i do want to talk about the sponsor of this video which is audible and how you can get access to a wide range of audiobooks absolutely for free and all you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash shadowversity or text shadowversity to 500 500 and you can sign up and get your first 30 days free now what does that get you not only can you select any audiobook from their entire range because you get a uh, monthly credit, but you get access to the Audible Plus catalog. These are select audiobooks, but not only that, self-help books, sleep tracks, uh, uh, also podcasts as well, a huge range of content that you get access completely for free. And if you sign up right away, you get all of that for free. Try it out. Uh, like It's no stress. Like I said, it's for free. And uh, I I love audiobooks. I use them for ages, well before I was a sponsor. And then the continuing subscription gets you access to a huge, like a massive range of audiobooks for a lower price than the retail cost of these audiobooks. In actual fact, the best way to kind of demonstrate how great the uh, deal is, the, the Audible subscription deal, how phenomenal it is, we can compare it to Swords. We've even done a skit to demonstrate and I think it's worth showing it. Welcome to Swordable, where I have the largest collection of swords anywhere in the world. Hello, good sir. Now, would you like a sword? I would like a sword. Can I have that one? Excellent choice. This is called the English Tree Hander. It's a fun little sword. Uh, it's yours for just five gold pieces. There you go. Excellent. Thank Ple you very much. Pleasure doing business. Greetings, Chad. Oh! Nathan, Sir Nathan. You're a member of the... Ah, you're a, you're a member. Welcome, welcome. What can I do for you, sir? Oh, I'm just wondering, I saw you sold another sword to a fellow here. How much it would be for me? Two, oh, hang on. Yeah. All you need to do is pay for your monthly credit. It's two gold pieces for a credit, and remember, you can trade that credit for any sword you like. Easy enough. Two, two gold. Wait, two, wait two, two gold? I, I bought this for five. It's the same sword. It, it, yeah, it is, but but Nathan's a member of uh, the, the subscription service. So, so what happens is, right, is if you become a member of Swordable, you get a monthly credit, which you can trade for any sword, regardless of its original price. Also, can I just grab something from the Plus catalog? Of course, yeah. Um, uh, any sword from the Plus catalog you can pick. Um, and uh, in fact, there are some sword originals that you can't get anywhere else. Um, so, so how do I get it on this thing? Actually, all you need to do is sign up. Um, and if you sign up, you get the, the, the your first 30 day free and you get a free monthly credit. And so technically, 
you would get that sort for free too, so... If I give you this back, you might have that. So, so... And then you get it for free because you're signing up. No, I'll have that back then. Okay, um... And you also get access to the Plus Catalog. I but... would like this one too. Yeah, there you go. Nice. If only you could buy swords in the same way, because it's a phenomenal deal, and I love audiobooks. I like listening to them when I'm using my hand, building something, cleaning, driving, but then I just get hooked and I love enjoying them just generally. I really do feel audiobooks are one of the great entertainment mediums of the modern day. The stories and quality that you can find is just so much better, so much in depth. The characters, it's phenomenal. And if you're wondering where to begin, you can try my own audiobook, Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror. It's an epic dark fantasy in kind of like a steampunk s setting. Or if you've already tried my audiobook, I highly recommend the Dresden File series. It is just an absolutely phenomenal series. It's about a wizard in the modern Modern day, it's funny, it's engaging, it's uh, you got a great range of books right there. Dive right into it. Again, all you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity, or if you're in the US, you text Shadowversity to 500 500. So give it a go, you won't regret it. I, I love audiobooks, genuinely, they are so enjoyable. And uh, thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. Now, the Gladius. So, as I was saying before, there might be this idea that the Gladius is a uh, ancient or older weapon that just we moved beyond, okay? Swords just got longer as you got into the medieval period and these shorter style swords just ended. That is false. There are many instances of shorter styled swords, very much in the kind of range what the Gladius was in, all throughout the medieval period. Granted, their role, what they did did evolve, okay? Whereas the Gladius, it's funny, like if you think it was only a battlefield weapon, that's all, this was a weapon for self-defense, it was used in nearly every capacity in which you think a sword would logically be used in. Yes, it was, as well as warfare, but the role that the shorter style swords played in warfare did get phased out a bit as a primary weapon. They're always present as a good, useful, absolutely useful, backup weapon. But in terms of a primary battlefield weapon, the battlefield did evolve, and we're going to go into a few examples of what might have, you know, changed on the battlefield that phased out the Gladius. But this style of sword still existed. When I say style, I'm talking about kind of blade profile, length, uh, width a little bit as well. Profiles did change, but in terms of this size sword, the style of the hilt certainly uh, changed because of culture and technology and things. But short swords definitely existed, they played a role for personal self-defense, but also because sometimes a smaller package gives you everything you need, and this is where we're going into kind of the utility of the Gladius and how useful it was, and then we're going to be looking at the battlefield context as well, as well as metallurgy, by the way, you know, how strong they were and things. So, first of all, in terms of uh, power, okay, cutting capacity, Misconception. People sometimes assume uh, longer swords cut better. I've already kind of debunked this in my video where I compare uh, weapon damage, mainly applying it to video games and role-playing games, but uh, some of the things we talk about in that video, check it out if you haven't seen it, applies very much in this video here, that bigger or longer swords, I should say, don't always do as much damage, or more damage, than smaller weapons. Uh, a dagger can be just as lethal in terms of its, um, how, how deep it can penetrate and uh, do lethal penetrative damage. A dagger can be just as lethal as an arming sword and other things, as a spear, as we found out. Cutting capacity is an interesting one, because I've already done tests looking at Gladius-style swords, so this is a modern uh, tactical-style Gladius, but it's actually a really good one. Like I said, tests, this thing is really sharp, really lethal, and the cutting capacity it has is actually as great or greater than swords much longer than it. This is a, a blunt one, but I've, we've compared it against, you know, arming length style swords, and the cutting capacity on this is crazy. The reason being is cutting capacity isn't just about size. More so, it's about sharpness, it's about the edge profile, it's about the width of the blade, and then also it's about weight. Weight is an interesting one because people can misunderstand how 
heavy certain swords are. People might assume that this arming sword is heavier than this shorter gladius. It's actually not. This gladius weighs, I think, well actually let's double check it. 1.1 kilos, this gladius, versus the arming sword, which is 1.1 as well, except, sorry, this was 1.15 and this is 1.12. So the arming sword is actually slightly lighter than this gladius. This is just to demonstrate that width, no, the actual depth, you know, looking along this plane of the sword, plays a major role in a weapon's weight. Even if on profile it looks smaller because it's shorter, it can actually be just as heavy, if not heavier. Thing is though, standard weights of gladiuses don't usually reach 1.1 kilos. This is an exceptionally heavy reproduction. Standard weights of gladiuses are from surviving, you know, examples that they've, uh, you know, found and tested. Granted, they're missing, usually missing their hilts because wood degrades and things. So you could add maybe 50 to 100 grams um, onto the usual weights, but they range from about 600 grams to uh, a kilo, which means this uh, tactical gladius I have here, which weighs 600 grams, is a perfectly adequate analog for many gladiuses in history. I know it's, when I say analog, cutting analog and blade profile, obviously not the finish or the handle. But as a result, this is a good example to show the variance in length that Gladius can come and different blade profiles. I will be talking about blade profiles in a second, but I want to finish talking about cutting capacity because this Gladius here, due to how sharp it is and the much better edge profile, just cuts way better than this one here. Like I said, sharpness and edge profile are the bigger determining factors. Now, in terms of cutting capacity, there is a misconception idea that gladiuses were only thrusting weapons. Now, it's true that there seems to be a, a more a, like a more emphasis and uh, records of thrusting, but there are plenty of evidences of them cutting. And so, when you know there are accounts of Roman battles and the injuries that the uh, soldiers are inflicting massive slashes, laceration cuts and everything are described. So they were definitely cutting with their gladiuses. And people, again, this is a misconception, assume smaller, shorter swords just don't cut as well as longer ones. No, 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 that's wrong. I, we've done the tests already. This, you know, gladius here is a cutting beast and cuts easily as well as a good sharp arming sword, if not more so because the weight is concentrated. By concentrating the weight into an actual, you know, focused area, that gives this area, when you strike with it and hit right there, some serious, you know, cutting potential. There's even these interesting videos, I showed this in the um, uh, uh, weapon damage video, of uh, smaller knives about this big cutting and hacking up wood like their axes, all right? Blade profile, weight concentration, sharpness, those are the main things. And so the gladius of history in the Romans, like depending on how well they're maintained, their edge profile and everything, have the potential to be insane cutting beasts. Like truly serious. These can chop off limbs, decapitate people. They all have that potential so long as yeah, like I said, profile and they are the appropriate sharpness. Weight and leverage of course do play an element. Weight has a, a more significant impact when you hit denser materials like bone and so having a bit of a heavier blade certainly helps and leverage also helps in those, uh, those regards. But sharpness, like really sharp and the correct profile, that can cut through a shocking amount of material. So in terms of utility, the Gladius is a thrusting beast and a cutting beast. This is an actual very versatile, effective sword in some of the primary ways in which you'd want to use swords. Indeed, it's even better than some other swords in terms of its cutting. Swords that you might think are just absolutely crazy. No, it can be just as good cutting even than the really big long ones. Obvious limitation is reach, but if you have a way to, you know, mitigate the, um, the, uh, the, the, the limitation with reach, suddenly this weapon is really, really effective. So now we come to the uh, types of Gladius. Now, it should be understood that when we say types, these are the general trends from 
um, ones that we have found in, you know, uh, archaeological digs and things. So it's not to say that they were restricted to these profiles. There's probably a lot of variants and uh, middle, so when we say like, look at these two profiles, there's probably certain designs of Gladius that were a mix between these two, somewhere in between. But the kind of standard profiles that people refer to in the modern day are the Pompeii, the Mains, the Fulham, and the, I think it's Huspiensis, or Huspiens, I, I'm terrible at that pronunciation. So this profile here is very much like the Mains Gladius style profile, where this one is more like the Fulham or Pompeii style. Uh, obviously a bit longer, there was a variance in length. And the Huspiens, uh, <laughs> terrible at the one, is uh, from the ones that were found. They're the ones that can range up to a kilo in weight, but even though finds show like a lot of gladius this size or and in this profile didn't exclude the very likely possibility that there would have been a number of these a bit longer because this thing uh, they did have longer swords the romans did and that's what we call the spatha the spatha is the name that has come to, to refer to basically ver same you know or very similar hilt style designs roman swords but longer blades that reach about the arming sword length so about this one but basically blade profile like a, uh, a gladius. Interesting, spatha also is a word that just translates in Latin to sword. Gladius is a kind of mutation or warped one from a Celtic kind of word, I'll bring it up here, that or, that uh, meant sword as well. And so we have multiple, you know, words in English that mean sword. And so uh, spatha and uh, gladius also just translate to sword. In the modern day, we refer to gladius being smaller, spatha being longer. But it's very unlikely that they had standardized set sizes. Uh, the legionnaires and uh, soldiers seem to refer, like, use the, sh the shorter type, and the longer type were used by cavalry, but it's very likely that they had, you know, lengths somewhere in between. Not as well represented, but it's a very likely possibility. What about metallurgy? What were they made out of? Now, this one here that I have is made out of good high carbon spring steel, but in the uh, Roman period, it largely depends, okay? There, the, the main study that was uh, done to look at, or like to determine what, you know, uh, quality of steel are in Roman swords, primarily gladiuses, was done in 1988, but it's still considered the standard and has been confirmed by later studies again. And they looked at several gladius and actually did a metallurgical analysis and found that there was quite a range in quality. I'll bring up the image here. And so in three of the swords, they had hardened martensite edges, and uh, this obviously looks to be differential hardening, by the way, which is a really good technique. Not just done in Japan with the katana, okay? And so a martensite edge with a, um, uh, like depending, it ranged from mild steel to medium carbon steel. And, uh, but the other thing is there were other gladius that would just look to be mild steel and medium carbon throughout. And in terms of purity, that was a variance as well. And so did that mean all Roman swords could be of good quality? It was variant. Sometimes there was low carbon, medium carbon, and then sometimes hardened martensite edges. This paper is a little tongue in cheek and funny because they said what this confirms is we at least know that I can confirm that was at least one Roman blacksmith that knew how to make high quality composite swords. I think it was composite. My shield fell down. We'll pick it up and use it in a second. Um, swords, and uh, because you know, did it mean this was representative out of the swords that were uh, that were studied? Ultimately, we don't know. It could be, you know, common amongst the better quality swords, but there are low quality gladiuses as well, made out of low carbon steel. Sometimes ones that you could even consider more iron. And so, also, where were they made? You know, there might have been areas that have better techniques to uh, forging the swords. And also, what about the cheap soldiers and, and uh, the, uh, the weapons that were made on the cheap for the general soldier and stuff versus the elites that would you know expect high quality. We see a variance now when sword quality couldn't be guaranteed all right uh, that does sometimes affect you know the design of swords. Uh, when you can guarantee the uh, you know quality of swords to the point where you can make them into springs see this this, this sword is a spring and uh, just have a look at it wobble like that, all right? So that means when it bends, it will spring back. To do that, you need high carbon steel that can be hardened into martensite, so that's the quenching, and then tempered, which releases some of the stresses to then make spring steel. 
um, like spring steel is phenomenal for swords, but a lot of the Roman swords didn't even have high carbon steel. And when they did, it was hardened on the edges to get martensite, which means the core was usually at least mild steel, sometimes just low carbon steel. Sorry, the middle was uh, medium carbon steel, sometimes low carbon steel. But that meant bending would have been an issue with their swords and you don't want bending. So the way that you can prevent your swords from bending is to make them more robust, a bit thicker. And like this one, even though it's a bit on the heavy side, but it is chunky as this is really hard to bend, really resistant to it. And I think a lot of the gladiuses would have been made with that philosophy in mind, but as a result, they would be pretty heavy if you made them too long. One of the ways that you can compensate is by making them shorter and they would have about the similar weight. Remember, they range from around 700 grams to a kilo. A kilo is the weight of arming sword ranges, like much longer swords. But sometimes they did get lighter as well, talking about the arming sword ones, but you can have that weight in a shorter package and get just greater cutting capacity because of all that, you know, additional weight to do more driving force. I remember I said it's not the ultra key thing. <laughs> Sharpness will do, be the main thing, but adding additional weight, and look, this is still a perfectly usable sword. It's on the heavy side. I do prefer one that's a bit lighter, but you know, something like this, which is around the 600 grams, still has enough weight to do some savage, savage cuts. And because of the edge profile and sharpness, really, really good. But when you make a longer sword, it can put more stresses on the blade. And so, you know, thicker, but then shorter. So we tend to, you know, if we're just following that philosophy, you will usually see swords of this size and length evolve out of necessity, but you get the, all the advantages of having a lot of punch in a small package. You have that issue about reach though, as I mentioned, but there is a, a way to overcome that, which we saw employed quite, you know, effectively by the Romans. Combine it with a very big shield. This is a, you know, fantasy um, LARP one, mainly for safety because I've sparred with wooden shields and injuries occur. And so honestly, these foam ones are a brilliant substitute, even if they're not 100% historically accurate. Um, but uh, in regards to um, the term tower shield, I think that's actually a perfectly fine umbrella term for really large shields like this that refer to a number of shields. So we have the Roman scutum, which is uh, the primary one that they use. By the way, it's not the only one. They had rounded kind of shields as well. But uh, in terms of the tower shield category, you've got the scutum, you've got um, the bevers there, you've got really large uh, kite shields as well. All of those go under the umbrella of tower shield perfectly fine. Okay, and so when you combine a gladius with a shield like this, suddenly the problems about its uh, reach that are uh, not only overcome, the size of sword actually becomes a bit of a virtue and advantage. And so this shield enables you to just close the distance, get up right up close. Just look at this thing, it's massive. Now, when you get up close to an enemy, even if you're in line with all you know, your soldiers and stuff, how much of an advantage would you get out of having a longer sword? Let's actually demonstrate. So I have Nathan here to demonstrate. Now, it, common wisdom is said that uh, gladiuses were used more for thrusting than cutting, but they definitely were used for cutting, okay? To say that they never were, that's wrong, and they can do devastating cuts, but okay, if we look at the thrusting thing, to thrust with a longer sword like this, I have to withdraw my arm vastly more to just get the point ready to stab him. And not only that, if I want a lead up, a follow through, I don't get much of, you know, a distance between the tip of the blade to build up a lot of momentum. And so whenever I want to stab, I've got to really pull my arm back and it's, it's vastly more awkward to do. Also, if I do do cuts, so if I want to cut at his head or cut there, pulling my arm there, or even keep my arm back, right? Look at how far the end of the blade is moving beyond the target because I'm already so close. Now, getting in close like this is, uh, you know, can be advantage, can be disadvantage because sometimes, you know, the um, uh, soldier line might want to be a bit further away. But the thing is, the advantage of such a big shield is that you can get close and still be protected. So if you get this close, okay, look. The, like half of the length of the sword is completely unneeded because it's moving right past the target. I reckon most of the cuts in uh, that the you know Roman soldiers were doing would be like kind of downward cuts like this because they would be in a rank. They'd have people would decide them. So sideways cuts, they end up hitting them. But you can do these types of cuts in a formation, absolutely, like downwards cuts, perfectly safe and fine. But as I mentioned, 
you're not even using most of the, the steel in this blade if it's not hitting. Change that to a Gladius, and even though this is a modern tactical one, it is very representative of the lengths that many Gladiuses came in. And so, like, my just holding it at rest, it's already ready to stab, where the arming sword I have to withdraw further. And then if I want to get leverage, I can withdraw it all the way and have all that space to, you know, build up momentum and do a really big stab. But, like, stabbing downways like this, I don't need to withdraw this very much at all. And uh, it's a vastly more convenient sized sword for this style of combat. And then in cutting, well, I mean, it's hitting on the, right on the money point, right there, okay? And so this size, it's brilliant for this type of warfare. Thank you, Nathan. So the limitations that people might assume from the length and size of the Gladius are actually a virtue of it when you combine it with a massive shield like that. It does raise a good, important question then. Well, if it's so good, why didn't people keep using it? Because it wasn't the only thing, like, if just using that style of tactic wouldn't make you unbeatable. It's a great combination, but there are other combinations that are somewhat similar. Uh, big shield and axe. Most battle axes, by the way, are only about this length in reach anyway. And so if that same demonstration, all right, anything longer, if you get really close, it makes it even more difficult to hit the enemy. What made the Romans so effective was not only their weapon combinations, it was their tactics and how they fought. But still, that doesn't mean that the Gladius and shield combination isn't devastating, just wasn't the ultimate winning thing. Because not only did the Gladius and Scutum combination uh, get kind of phased out on the battlefield, but the shield wall formations got phased out a decent amount as well, and uh, it's a complex discussion as to what caused that, but one of the primary things was the implementation of cavalry in a larger measure. Cavalry was used before the medieval period, but in terms of the mounted charge and uh, other tactics and everything like that, suddenly you have a bit of a problem with a weapon with vastly less reach because someone who was on horseback and much higher up, they're further away than you. And if they have a weapon that's longer that can reach you, and remember one of the you know types of swords that the Roman cavalry used was actually the spuff the longer version, okay, because when you are higher up, you're further away from your opponent, so a longer weapon to be able to reach them is what you'll need. And if they come into battle with weapons that can reach you and you can't reach them, well, suddenly you have a bit of a problem. And so even if you still are using a shield wall, because, you know, people on cavalry are much harder to reach, you might be better served with using a longer sword Still, like, even with, like, shields to close the distance, but having a longer weapon that has chances to actually strike at the cavalry coming by might be, you know, more beneficial. Not only the cavalry, I mean, at the, you know, riders mounted on the cavalry as well. There's also the matter of technological evolution. Now, as great as the um, uh, Gladius is, okay, one of his weaknesses would be against more advanced types of armor. Uh, I think, you know, the, like this is a very robust point as you see here, and I think this would have some decent success getting through mail with a really strong, you know, jab, but it's actually much broader than other tips that are more specifically designed to be able to handle mail much better and get in the gaps of armor. And so even though I think you could at, you know, times get this through mail, it's not optimized for it. Having a much more acute point might be more successful. And that's the kind of what we see in the medieval period, not just with like arming swords and long swords, but even the shorter swords, we see them with much more narrow and acute points when armor became more common and more developed. So like, example, right? Mail wasn't massively common amongst the Vikings. They had it, but a lot of their swords were not optimized to get through mail, okay? There was still plenty of enough people wearing many things other than mail armor, which meant stabbing and slashing like types of attacks were really effective. But when, you know, armor became vastly more common, you might need weapons either more designed better to handle them or uh, optimized for that type of warfare where we see more spears, lances on horseback, pole arms and things, and uh, we see evolution in warfare in that regard. Doesn't mean this style of blade and length of sword didn't go out of fashion. What it does mean is that in the situations in which uh, armor wasn't as common, that's where they would, were still used, all right? So yes, they were less seen on the battlefield as that evolved, but shorter swords, you know, put, we use for personal defense very commonly. And uh, an example of this is 
falchions and messes. This is a cutlass, but the blade is actually very representative of what um, many <laughs> like falchion blades are like, particularly because of how thin it is. But have a look at the length, okay? These swords are basically similar in length. This one's the tiniest bit longer, but basically just as short, speaking generally. And uh, <laughs> like, falchions and messes were very popular, especially for self-defense. And short swords were still worn as sidearms and backups, not just arming swords. And so, to say the gladius was an inferior sword and got phased out, is wrong. Short swords were still used in the medieval period and into the Renaissance, and what we see evolving is some of the profile, but the hilt construction mainly. But you could take this blade, okay? So look at this sword, take this blade and put a medieval style hilt on it. So look at this arming sword. If we remove this blade and put the gladius blade onto it, you would say that's a perfectly acceptable standard, you know, short sword of the medieval period. Of course, there are other more common changes like adding fullers to them and other things like that, but I just want to address the idea that the gladius is an inferior sword because uh, we don't see them in the medieval period when in actual reality we see uh, you know close enough variants with the main changes being the the style of hilt and maybe a floor on the blade but no short swords actually can pack tremendous punch and the gladius is one of the great examples of that because uh, the Romans use it as a primary battlefield weapon and they use it to great effect because it was so devastatingly effective in the cut and in the thrust and these style of swords when I say style I'm talking about overall length of blade and their cutting capacity was still used just in different contexts. The Romans applied them to such great and devastating effect on the battlefield. And there we have it. This is the Gladius. It is an awesome weapon, still great, and actual fact, still find certain uses uh, even in the modern day, because I did a video on looking at what the best, you know, weapon for modern day self-defense is, and guess what I, you know, I came to. If you want to check out the reasons why, you can look at the video, but there are reasons what made the Gladius great, and those reasons still exist even when you reproduce them and make modern replicas. Like, because this says it crazy good at cutting and uh, insanely good at thrusting. So, thank you for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you on the next video here on Shadowversity. So, until that time, farewell.